Do you think you found a skeleton? How would you tell people that was You first, first, first. How would you tell us? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Hey there YouTube, the Dabber Dinosaur here. I'm back to take another look at Answers News. It's been a while and this time there's no Ken Ham, which is disappointing. But there were some topics that they covered that I wanted to talk about, so here we are. Let's just jump into it. Were Neanderthals brutish ape men or fully human? I appreciate that we're just diving in. So ape man doesn't really mean anything because all humans are just as much an ape as any other ape. Humans are no less ape than chimpanzees, gorillas, or orangutans. As for fully human, I don't know what that means. I've never seen a consistent set of criteria other than those for the species Homo sapiens that could be said to define a human in a scientific way. So if the question is, were Neanderthals Homo sapiens, then the answer is definitively no. But that doesn't make them brute animals. They were exceptionally intelligent and sophisticated, and since they're a sister species to Homo sapiens, this should come as no surprise. In today's top story, researchers admit that Neanderthals and modern humans are more closely related than most people think. You gotta love the admit phrasing, as if the researchers were reluctant to publish findings about the similarities of modern humans to one of their closest relatives. Also, how similar do most people think the two species were? I don't know. I haven't seen polling. Nor do I seem to have my fingers on the pulse of paleoanthropology takes from the public. I also doubt that Georgia does either. I'm Dr. Georgia Purdom, this is Roger Patterson and Rocket Rob Webb. For those unaware, Georgia Purdom has a PhD in molecular genetics, Roger Patterson has a bachelor's degree in biology, and Rob Webb has a master's in aerospace engineering and used to fly spaceships for NASA. None of them are anthropologists, paleoanthropologists, or paleontologists. And so we're going to get right into this with Neanderthals might not be the separate species we always thought. This PopSci article is referencing a PLOS One paper entitled Formation Process, Fire Use, and Patterns of Human Occupation Across the Middle Paleolithic, MIS 5A through 5B, of Gruta de Oliveira, Almonda Car System, Torres Novas, Portugal, by Angelucci et al., dated October 11th, 2023. You might be shocked to learn that the paper never actually argues for or concludes that any change in the taxonomy of Neanderthals should be made. It doesn't even come up. Both the PopSci article and the real paper are linked to the description. Now here's the thing. As we. biblical creationists, we never thought they were Who's separate the we? species. <laughs> Who's the we here? Yeah. We already knew they were the same species. They're fully human. And we know that not just from, I mean, I'm a geneticist, so I've, I mean, they've sequenced the Neanderthal DNA and compared it to human DNA, and we know it's very, very similar. About as similar as a wolf and a coyote, meaning that Neanderthals were a different species. And while there was hybridization in Eurasia with Homo sapiens and H. neanderthalensis, it was not the free flow of genes across the populations that you would expect when two groups of conspecifics start inhabiting the same area. Indeed, that free flow of genetic material is one of the things that makes a species a species. Neanderthals were also another species under the ecospecies and morphospecies concepts. An ecospecies is a group of organisms adapted to a particular niche in a particular environment, and we know that Neanderthals hunted uniquely in a unique environment when compared to H. sapiens. The morphospecies is a group of organisms with a distinct morphotype that is significantly different to the point that a consistent set of diagnostic morphological traits can be used to distinguish the population from all other known populations. Neanderthals meet this definition with things like their chest shape, their limb proportions, their retromolar gap, and their occipital bun. It is also not clear just how compatible the genomes of H. sapiens and H. neanderthalensis really were, as there has never been an observed Neanderthal Y chromosome in a hybrid or crossing into a mostly H. sapiens individual. That might indicate that while male H. sapiens and female H. neanderthalensis couplings could produce hybrids, that male H. neanderthalensis and female H. sapiens crossings could not. No matter what Diego Angelucci says during an interview, and that he didn't publish on, because he can't support it in the literature, there is currently no move in paleoanthropology to resurrect the taxon Homo sapiens neanderthalensis. So we would definitely say from a genetic standpoint they're clearly related. Well, yeah, they're a sister species to Homo sapiens. This isn't a point of contention. Evolutionary biology indicates very strongly that modern humans and Neanderthals are extremely closely related. Um, and we're clearly kind of one in the same here. Yeah, you know, except for that limited interfertility, niche differences, and significant and obvious morphological differences unique to each group and not shared between them. The exact kind of differences that would distinguish species. But also from a lot of the archaeological finds for mm -hmm. Neanderthals. 
And the paper in question is in fact about archaeology. In fact, the lead author, who is the only one I can see associated with this paper who is challenging the classification of Neanderthals, is an archaeologist, meaning that he is unqualified to speak with any authority about the proper taxonomic designation for Neanderthals. That being said, he is quite right about the fact that Neanderthals were sophisticated organisms with a complex culture that included the use of well-designed and well-crafted stone tools, jewelry, and fire. Also, given where they often lived and when, they must also have made some use of protective clothing to keep warm. Yeah, so as we look at these specimens, uh, these were first found in the uh, area of Germany known as the Neander Valley, and they look at these specimens and they thought early on from the 1860s that these were kind of these hunched over, brutish cavemen. And Well, they are indeed stooped a bit compared to modern humans, and they definitely lived in caves. This paper is itself reporting on an archaeological dig in a cave in Portugal that found Neanderthal artifacts. As for brutish, in the strict sense, that means incapable of speech, and I have no idea if Neanderthals were able to speak in a way modern humans would recognize as language. However, I will say that primates in general, especially anthropoids, that is, monkeys, have a very complex vocal communication system, far beyond the usual for most animals. Apes are even more sophisticated in terms of communication, and I have no doubt that whatever kind of communication Neanderthals used, it was far more sophisticated than even that used by chimpanzees and would have been closer to contemporary homo sapiens than to the communication used by non-hominin apes. I like to think that they had a language, but that's just me and my emotional hope. It's not backed by anything. So it seems like the description of hunched brutish caveman is actually not entirely inaccurate, although certainly they were more like modern humans than they were at first depicted. They told the story that they were these grunting, brutish creatures, and they were maybe kind of human-like, and they probably walked upright, but... They surely weren't fully human. Again, that doesn't mean anything. It's like asking if coyotes are fully wolf. Well, no, they're coyotes. That's their own thing. They don't need to be measured against wolves any more than we should measure wolves against coyotes. Wolves and coyotes have many similarities, and they are closely related species. In the same way, it makes no sense to measure Neanderthals against modern humans or vice versa. They were their own species, and of course, they were very similar to your own and you've probably seen all the cartoons and the stereotypical things, and maybe you've even been called a Neanderthal (laughs) by somebody, (laughs) and it's probably condescending. To my knowledge, I have never been called a Neanderthal, nor would I call anyone a Neanderthal. But as we've studied them and understand more about them, they had musical instruments, they Mm -hmm. painted, they had jewelry, they buried their dead, they, they did all these things that are fully human. So just having a culture similar to humans makes you fully human? I mean, okay, but that just as much makes humans fully Neanderthal. Ironically, the only people I see pushing Neanderthals as just inhuman brutes are other creationists like Fuzrana, an old earth creationist who has described the mating of Homo sapiens and Neanderthals as bestiality. No scientists working in relevant fields are asserting this that I'm aware of. Further, this is just creationists complaining about scientists adapting to new data. This is exactly what science is supposed to do. Every time I see creationists complaining about science advancing, I think to how pitifully they complain that they really love science when all their actions betray the fact that they hate it. They refuse to participate in it, except in the most trivial ways. They malign the very process. They complain constantly about the very idea of simply following the data. They accuse scientists of being part of a conspiracy to hide God, etc. And so as more was uncovered about them archaeologically, there was no way that we could refute that they had these fully human capacities from the archaeological perspective, but that's the science side. Biblically speaking, we couldn't say that they weren't humans either. The Bible has nothing about Neanderthals in it, for the same reason it has nothing about moose, penguins, and dinosaurs. Or at least dinosaurs that aren't birds. The authors of the Bible all lived in and around the region of Western Mediterranean and Mesopotamia between 4,000 and 2,000 years ago. None of these things were known to them. You can't learn a single thing about Neanderthal history from the Bible. Even the Table of Nations that is a legendary, and we know for a fact, not actual account of the history of various peoples, tracing them back to the mythical Noah, doesn't account for them, because it represents people groups known to the ancient Hebrews, which did not include Neanderthals. As we know from the archaeological record, they were long gone by the Iron Age when the texts of the Bible were composed. No one writes an etiology for something they don't know ever existed, and that's why there's no etiology for the Neanderthals in the Bible. You have to contort the Bible almost out of all recognition to fit the Neanderthals anywhere in there, and that's precisely what Answers in Genesis has done with the Bible. 
They don't take the narrative of Genesis literally. They don't believe in a firmament with windows or a cosmic ocean that God let in to cause the flood, even though that's literally what's in there. Yeah, biblically speaking, I mean, these are post-flood Ice Age people descended from Adam. There's another thing. There is absolutely no indication of any Ice Age in the Bible. That's yet another way in which rather than simply taking the Bible at its word, Answers in Genesis inserts their own ideas into it. You see, no one who read the Bible before the evidence of geologically recent glaciation came to be recognized had any idea about an ice age. In fact, the mechanisms proposed by Answers in Genesis for a post-flood ice age don't even work, but it became so glaringly obvious that there had to have been some period of significant glaciation in the past, as evidenced by things like the mummies of woolly mammoths and woolly rhinos, that they had to shove an ice age into Genesis, just like they had to shove the round earth and space into Genesis. That's because they don't actually care about the text. They have core beliefs that are only tangentially related to the text of Genesis, and they will manipulate and toss out the text of Genesis to make it fit with those core beliefs, just as much as they'll manipulate science for the same reason. The only times they change is when presented with something so obviously true that to deny it would make them lose credibility even with their own constituents. Answers in Genesis is like a black hole of intellectual integrity course and uh, throughout the article you know they throw out a lot of imaginary times you know like uh, multiple thousands of years of course and of course by imaginary he means inconvenient because they show I'm wrong the problem is that despite decades of trying no creationist has actually managed to show a reason that these dating techniques are unreliable that has stood up to scrutiny by actual experts in relevant fields as a result, they remain, as near as anyone can tell, reliable ways to get the ages of various types of artifacts and fossils or subfossils. But what's so interesting, though, is they talk about, like Mr. P was saying here, uh, you know, tools, makeup, jewelry, they buried their dead, and they cooked meals. They said they had a cooking a range of meats, including goat, deer, and horses. Mm. Sounds pretty sounds, human to me. Sounds and pretty tasty, me. right? Yeah, I'd throw <laughs> that on the grill. Yeah, I'd smoke that. Um, but um, I... Again, this is like pointing out that just like wolves, coyotes eat deer, fruit, and rabbits, meaning that coyotes are fully wolf. No, that's not what that indicates. It indicates that two related species that occupy similar niches in environments with similar fauna have similar diets. That's not surprising, nor is it really surprising that Neanderthals were cooking with fire, since fire use in the human lineage goes back to at least Homo erectus, earlier than either H. sapiens or H. neanderthalensis. I love how the article says it here. They say, Gone is the archaic stoop and animalistic grunting. Today, our primitive relatives appear to have intentionally buried their dead, made jewelry, and made even uh, created art. Evidence that they carefully used fire in their technology only further builds a case that the Neanderthal culture was far from simple and far more akin to our own. It's akin, not akin. But yes, this is fascinating stuff. And remember, before Neanderthals were discovered, there weren't a bunch of creationists suggesting that there should be another species of human out there that descended from Noah that was very similar to modern humans with a sophisticated culture. That's a strike against the entire narrative being literally true. So now creationists are left to huff copious amounts of copium and seize upon anything that makes Neanderthals and themselves seem more similar than might have been previously presumed, like an arctic fox leaping on a mouse under the snow. So you see, they weren't just dumb brutes, like, they were actually very intelligent people. They actually made all these great things. So it was, it's actually a paradox for evolution. They can't explain it, but it is consistent with the biblical worldview. It's a paradox that a species closer related to another species was very similar to that species? How so? Isn't that a prediction of evolution? That sister species should be very similar? It's almost like that's why we analogize them to close family relationships, like sibling or cousin relationships. The reason that in the past they were thought to be so much less similar is mostly because it wasn't clear just how closely related the two species really were, which is understandable given that we had less archaeology from the Neanderthals and we didn't have the ability to do genome sequencing and comparisons. And there are a lot of different human forms in the sense of, um, you know, we talk about Neanderthals, but there's also Denosovans, which is another sort of more what they would call archaic human. It's Denisovan, not Denusovan, Georgia. And we don't actually have much in the way of information about Denisovans. We don't even have a real taxonomic designation for them. We know they existed because we have a finger, bone, and a tooth, and a genome, and we know that modern East and Central Asians have significant genetic descent from them, much in the same way that people in Europe and the Middle East have significant Neanderthal descent. There are, there's Homo erectus, which is, again, should be Homo sapiens. There's no possible world in which Homo erectus and H. sapiens would be in the same species. It's not even clear that H. erectus should be a single species in the first place, rather than like three or six or more or something. 
Homo erectus is characterized by a flat skull, a very pronounced brow ridge, ubiquity of sagittal, frontal, and coronal keels, much smaller brains than modern humans on average. They also lack many of the traits of H. sapiens that are characteristic of the species, such as the rounded back of the skull and a chin. At this point, it's even less clear to me what could possibly be meant by fully human. Is it just a bipedal ape? Because that will include a lot of animals that Answers in Genesis would not like to be included. It's because they've given them different species names because supposedly they're either, um, they either diverged off of the, some, this ape-like ancestor from all of us and they kind of went their own way, but this line became modern human, or they're somewhere in that line leading to modern human. No, they're given different species names because they meet at least one and often more than one definition for species, meaning that they deserve recognition as such. This would be true regardless of evolution, because species were being named long before Darwin published what would become the foundation of the modern theory of evolution. And the criteria on which species were named then are not very different to how the criteria are used now. That's why virtually all of the species named back in the 19th century are still considered valid today. Now, to some extent, what a species is, is a bit arbitrary. Nature doesn't care about humans and their classification schemes. But that being said, it is a useful category for humans to use to organize their study of the natural world, and nothing short of an overhaul of the historic and current use of the term could possibly unite modern humans and Homo erectus into a single species, and of course doing so would also lump many modern species into one, such as the grey wolf, the red wolf, the golden jackal, and the coyote. I suppose one could make the argument for that being a better way to categorize species, but as it stands now, that is not how scientists use the term, and under current usage, Homo erectus, Denisovans, Neanderthals, and Homo sapiens are all definitely different species. But as we study them and understand them as much as we can from fossils, from archaeology, from DNA, we see that they're fully human and they're just, you know, there's a, God put a lot of variety even within the human form. I don't know who this we is because Georgia is part of the group of people trying to halt scientific progress. But archaeology and most importantly paleogenomics have done nothing to suggest that Neanderthals and Homo erectus are in the same species as Georgia which I suppose could be seen as a compliment to those species and an insult to her own. Indeed, it was genomics that finally put to bed any real question about Neanderthals being the same species. Even the genetics work done by Nathaniel Jeanson manages to pretend that Neanderthals don't exist, and it imagines the history of all of Noah's sons in modern human groups, and that's simply because even with his vastly accelerated substitution rate, which we know from measured substitution rates in modern and historical human populations, he can't fit Neanderthal genomes into the human lineage descended from Noah without putting the flood tens of thousands of years ago, rather than only about four and a half thousand years ago. Further, he simply asserts without evidence that the genomes of Neanderthals are unreliable, something Georgia, another scientist, doesn't seem to agree with, based on this Answers News episode, where she's relying on the genetic data as reliable to indicate similarity with Homo sapiens. In fact, if the genome was unreliable because of degradation, as Nathaniel Jeanson says, we could not actually sequence a consensus genome for Neanderthals. The very fact that this has happened is prima facie evidence that the genomes are not so degraded as to be unreliable. And there's the problem. On the one hand, to make sense of the Neanderthals without the framework of evolution, AIG needs them to just be another group of Homo sapiens that descended from Noah after the Flood. And so they need the genomes to work so they can pretend that the similarity between Neanderthals and modern humans is so great that they're the same species, despite the evident limited reproductive compatibility. But on the other hand, in order to get the time frame for the genetics to line up, they have to reject those same genomes as unreliable. You see, when your ideas require contradictory things about the world to be true, it's a good indication that your ideas are wrong. And it's many audiences I know that I've looked out on over the years. Trust me, I can see some <laughs> of those heavy brow ridges yes. and some of those other things that are associated with Neanderthals. We still see some of those traits even in people today. No, you don't. You're not seeing platycephalic skulls, occipital buns, retromolar gaps, at least before wisdom tooth extraction, or a lack of chin in modern humans. Neither has Georgia seen any modern human with the barrel-shaped torso of a Neanderthal as opposed to the triangular torso of a modern human. Georgia is just lying about what characteristics are simply typical of Neanderthals versus modern humans, as opposed to which traits are diagnostic of the two. No modern human has the diagnostic traits of a Neanderthal, and no Neanderthal had the diagnostic traits of a modern human, with the only exceptions being recent hybrids, none of which persist. Um, but we're all human beings, right? Made in the image of God, descended from Adam and Eve. If that were true, Giorgio wouldn't have to say so many verifiably false things in order to support it. 
Yeah, and as we think about all of those characteristics, it's genetic diversity that God's programmed in as they spread out after the flood. We see those things in different people groups, and it's a reminder to us that God has that diversity everywhere. Hey, they're introducing the concept of created heterozygosity, the idea that God programmed into Adam and Eve maximal genetic diversity, and that since then, genetic diversity has been decreasing via natural selection. And that the reason that humans have differences based on where they live is a result of the reduction of the genetic diversity through natural selection. Now, there are some problems with this. First, there is far too much genetic diversity in humans to match with a young Earth creationist narrative. If we assume that at the time of the Flood, Noah's sons' wives were as maximally diverse between them as possible, that means that for each gene, we get six alleles for the wives, and since all the genetic diversity of Noah's sons is already contained in he and his wife, we get to add four more alleles for each gene. So each gene in the best case scenario starts out after the flood with 10 alleles. There are more than 1,000 chemically distinct forms of hemoglobin, a single protein, in humans, some of which cause essentially no effect on humans, some of which cause health problems. This means that each one has at least one allele associated with it, and given that synonymous mutations are a thing, the actual number of hemoglobin alleles could be much higher, several thousand in fact. Just this level of genetic diversity would mean that a new hemoglobin allele would have to, on average, arise not just each generation, but virtually every single year. Yet we know that the inside of genes are mutational cold spots, and that any given gene is exceptionally unlikely to experience a mutation in any given reproductive event. There simply is no plausible way to go from a maximum of 10 hemoglobin alleles to thousands over the course of 4,400 years since the flood. And there's a term that pops up in here that we need to be careful of as we think about uh, consuming uh, different media reports and watching videos. The term here is cousins. But here we're safe to call these our cousins because they belong to the same kind because they're humans. If you want to say that modern humans and Neanderthals are both in the biblical kind you call human, you'll have to define both human and kind rigorously and falsifiably. No creationist that I'm aware of has really attempted either, with the possible exception of Donnie Badinsky, who came up with the chin as a definition for human, apparently not realizing that this means that only Homo sapiens would count as human, and that all other hominins would not, even though he himself thinks that many hominins, such as Neanderthals, Homo thuringiensis, and Homo erectus, are human. Until these terms are defined, saying that modern people and Neanderthals are both human and in the same kind doesn't actually mean anything. They truly are humans. Uh, We'll come to a a story a little later that we need to be uh, looking out for that word because this other group is not our cousins. I'm sure we'll get at least a citation to a rigorous study with a useful definition for kind that will demonstrate this, and it won't just be based on eyeballing it and incredulity. All right, dinosaur feathers may have been more bird-like than previously thought. Okay. I hate this headline for the implication that birds are not dinosaurs, but oh well. Over and over and over again, we see this idea that dinosaurs evolved into birds and birds are modern day dinosaurs. Probably something to do with the fact that birds meet every diagnostic criterion for being a dinosaur. And you know, all of these. Uh, and it's even confusing to read articles like this sometimes yeah. because you're like, wait a minute, are they talking about a dinosaur or are they talking about a bird? It's- They're always talking about dinosaurs, and in this case, mostly about not birds. But the birds they're talking about are dinosaurs because that's how evolution works. If you evolve from a group, you're a member of that group. It's a non-avian dinosaur. Yeah, a a non-avian dinosaur dinosaur is a bird, which is really confusing, but true. No, in fact, that's the opposite of how it works. Avian is the adjective for of or having to do with aves. That is the group of animals that is synonymous with birds. So a non-avian dinosaur is by definition a dinosaur that is not in aves, and thereby is not a bird in the strict sense. 
Now, some people are a bit loosey-goosey with the colloquial term bird, and will include various Peruvian dinosaurs that are not strictly in Aedes, but are close to it, as birds in the colloquial sense. But I would argue that, strictly speaking, this is a misidentification, and yes, that would mean that Archaeopteryx wouldn't be a bird. So, um, anyway, so what they're looking at is the keratin, which is the main protein in feathers, to see the form of keratin. So there's two basic forms, alpha and beta. And they would say that birds typically have beta keratin in, that make up their feathers. This is true. Beta keratin is a stronger but more complex form of keratin, and it helps feathers maintain their rigidity. But they used to think that dinosaurs had more of the alpha keratin, and so the, what they say is that those would have been more flimsy feathers and wouldn't have actually allowed them to fly, and so um, they seemed very different. But now they've done some testing, and they say, well, it could just be because of heat, and that heat has caused the beta keratin to go to alpha keratin. It just folded differently in three-dimensional space. More specifically, they looked at both a feather from a 50 million year old bird and the 125 million year old raptor, Cynornithosaurus, and found that both seemed to contain alpha keratin, which would be a problem for the bird in life if its feathers were indeed composed of alpha keratin. They then took a modern feather and simulated the conditions of heat and pressure experienced by fossils, and found that it denatured the keratin proteins to look more like alpha keratins, again the simpler form of keratin. This means that simply because keratin molecular fossils look like alpha keratin, Scientists cannot, for that reason, rule out that the structure was originally beta keratin, because the current state of the molecular fossil may be a taphonomic effect. And so they may actually have the same kind of keratin as the bird feather. So yeah. is that legit? Not really. So the line of thinking was that as these creatures were evolving along these lines, that uh, the dinosaurs developed these feathers so that they could use them for um, warmth or attracting mates or maybe some flapping and catching insects. They were a, a kind of a, a thing that would help them grab more insects as they were running along the ground, kind of a scooping, like a net-like mechanism, all kinds of things like this that feathers could have been useful for. And along this parallel branch, birds were also developing these things. So what parallel branch? Birds are dinosaurs. They inherited their feathers from previously feathered dinosaurs. They did not evolve them separately, but in about the same way. This is just a gross misunderstanding of evolution. Pro tip, if you think you're going to take down the dominant paradigm in all of biology, you probably need to understand that paradigm in the first place. These two different forms of this keratin, this protein, so proteins are long chains of amino acids that are folded up and they fold in slightly different forms, this alpha and this beta form. That's true. So one would be flimsy and one would be strong. Well, there's even a very clear statement from one of the scientists in here. We don't even know if that was true. So the different ways that uh, all of these feathers are fossilized, that, as we find them in the, in the fossil record, the different types of pressure and heat that they experience as they're buried, they would undergo these different um, denaturing of the proteins. Think about cooking an egg, the protein changes form, so it changes color. That's the type of changes that we'd see here as these happen. So we go from this alpha form to this beta form as it unfolds. And First, Georgia said that non-avian dinosaurs means it's a bird. And now this guy thinks that alpha unfolds into beta keratin when that's exactly the opposite of what happens. I mean, did they even read the article, never mind the actual paper cited in it? Apparently not. Or at best, they skimmed it. Or, and this is what I actually suspect, they read the article and barely understood it, because they don't know anything about dinosaurs, keratin, or taphonomy. Is that really what's happening here as we see dinosaur feathers and bird feathers? Are they changing forms? And that's the question they're trying to answer. No, the question they're trying to answer, and which they seem to have answered, is do molecular keratin fossils that resemble alpha keratin exclude the possibility that in life the structures in question were actually composed of beta keratin? And the answer is no. We can't simply use the alpha keratin-like state of molecular fossils in feathers to conclude that the feathers were actually composed of alpha keratin, meaning that when beta keratin started being used for dinosaur integumentary fibers, aka feathers and protofeathers, is something we can't really be sure of at this time. And as far as we can tell from what happened here in this article, they didn't really come to any conclusive um, findings here. And it's just a bunch of back and forth and one scientist is disagreeing with another, which is fine. That's the way scientists works. 
science works. We, we go back and forth and we disagree with each other and we argue back and forth, but there's really no solid conclusions here as they, as they get to the end of the article. Yeah, the research just doesn't fly at the end of the day. What the f*** are they talking about? Now, I'm pretty sure they just didn't read the article, but you should. It's linked in the description, and there are no scientists fighting about this. There's no failure to come to a conclusion. The question being asked isn't even when did birds evolve beta keratin feathers. There is no way they read this article, or if they did, they're just outright lying. Which means that they're lying either way. Either they read the article and are now lying about its content, or they lied about reading it. Take your pick, creationists. I guess the meme remains true. Among honest, well-informed, and creationist, you can pick at most two. So yeah, it's um, it, it, it just cracks me up here too. They say the simplest interpretation is that the distorting effects of fossilization led previous researchers astray in thinking dinosaur and bird feathers were so different molecularly. No, that is not the simplest. That is not, no, it's the biblical explanation that we need to go back to. Biblically speaking, I mean, simply this, birds were made on day five, dinosaurs, land animals were made on day six. That's it, we're done, right? Even if that's true, it doesn't actually answer the question about the molecular makeup of now fossilized feathers in life. Seriously, this is like asking Rob for a recipe for some no-bake cheesecake. And instead, he tells you that it's simple if you just remember that God created cows in the Garden of Eden and that they survived the flood on Noah's Ark. Like, okay, even if that were true, it doesn't begin to answer the question. The question at issue in this article is one about whether we can distinguish fossilized alpha and beta keratin. And the response is, well, birds were created on a different day of creation week than other dinosaurs. Coupled with pretending that birds aren't even dinosaurs. And, um, that's just not relevant to the question at hand. Is that just another reminder that the interpretation matters? No one ever comes to the evidence. No one ever comes to the facts in an unbiased, uh, neutral fashion. Everyone always has a worldview. That's why it's so critical as Christians. We get back to having a right worldview. We got to build all of our thinking on God's word. It's true. It's essentially impossible for humans to get rid of all their biases, which is why we put in place checks and balances as much as possible. In the legal system, that involves courts of appeal. If a judge was biased against a defendant, and the defendant can show that to be the case in front of other judges who do not share that bias in a court of appeal, then the judgment can be overturned or modified in the defendant's favor to correct for the bias. In science, we have peer review. People who are not the scientists in question try to poke holes in their findings, holes the original researcher may not have noticed because of his or her bias. The fact is, though, that when we do our best to eliminate as much bias as possible from biology and paleontology, what we have is the theory of evolution and universal common descent, and only in echo chambers where biases are not challenged, like the Answers Research Journal, which won't even accept papers that don't follow its statement of faith, can ideas as unsupported and incoherent as those espoused by young Earth creationists survive. Science is by far the best tool we have to get rid of bias in the reporting of facts. Too bad this panel has abandoned it because the minimally biased analysis of the world violated their biases. And thus, whenever we see articles like this, if it doesn't line up with scripture, we need to reject it. If something disagrees with my reading of a book, then I reject that thing is perhaps the least scientific heuristic you could possibly have, and transparently so. It's hard to even explain just how bad of an idea that is if your goal is to believe things that are true and not believe things that are false. If the Bible be the word of God, surely Rob here doesn't have a monopoly on how to interpret it with his feeble human brain. So the fact that his already nonsensical exegetical approach is at odds with almost all of reality should be a wake-up call to him, not cause for him to reject reality. Remember, the Bible depends on reality to even exist. Reality is prior to the Bible, and therefore it is the standard by which the Bible and any interpretations thereof must be judged. Unfortunately, for people like Answers in Genesis, that means that characters like Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah, Adam, and Eve simply didn't exist in any way that's recognizably similar to what a literal reading of Genesis would imply. That's not to say that that's true of all biblical characters. Herod the Great, Herod Antipas, Pontius Pilate, Jesus, Josiah, Darius, and even David and Solomon all existed, and would probably be recognizable in their actual biographies from their depiction in the Bible, even if the biblical texts take some liberties with them, especially in cases like David and Solomon, who were much more likely local chieftains than kings of a unified Hebrew kingdom. And what was interesting, too, I, I was looking at this, and they said, well, the, two of the feathers that they researched, okay, and actually used for the study, so they compared a 50-million-year-old mil bird feather. Now, they don't identify what that bird was. That's because it was an isolated feather from the Green River Formation. That's an Eocene formation consisting of alternating color seasonal depositions in the area of the Green River, a tributary of the Colorado River. The formation is known for exceptional preservation of the kind Andrew Snelling says can only happen during a global flood, even though being Eocene in age, 
It's what Answers in Genesis would say is post-flood rock. And they say that based on the so-called research of that very same Andrew Snelling. Gee, it's like everywhere I look, there's just more evidence of professional creationists lying through their teeth. Weird, isn't it? Anyway, Georgia could have realized that if she, you know, bothered to check the sources cited in this pop sci article, like I did, the paper in question isn't even behind a paywall. She's just too lazy, I guess. But they just say it's a bird feather to a 125 million year old feather from this non-avian dinosaur. What I, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. It's Cynornithosaurus, an animal in the same family as Velociraptor of Jurassic Park fame. And although the Popsite article doesn't mention it, they also used a Confuciusornis feather. Confuciusornis is not technically an avies, but it's so close that many people couldn't tell it apart from a modern bird, except perhaps for its teeth and the hints of claws poking from the leading edge of its wings. Go for it. Do it for Soros. Okay. Anyway, so I asked Ga Dr. Gabriella Haynes, who's our paleontologist, that has actually done a lot of research on this particular subject of feathered dinosaurs. Unless she's done a lot of research very recently, then she has done basically no research, because the last paper of hers on dinosaurs and birds that was published in the Answers Research Journal indicated that she didn't know what Carolus Linnaeus wrote about birds, despite citing him, that she didn't know how to read a basic cladogram, and that she was confused about the very basic anatomical terms around birds and dinosaurs. In fact, I took a deep dive into that paper live on this channel. You should check out that video for more information on what an insect paleontologist whose thesis refuted flood geology, despite her being a young earth creationist, has to say about birds. Spoiler, it's nothing intelligent. And she said, well, that non-avian dinosaur, that's a bird. It's a bird. <laughs> so they essentially compared a yeah. bird feather to a bird feather, and they both had different forms of the keratin. I want to drive this home. On screen are two skeletal reconstructions. One of them is Deinonychus, which is depicted by AIG as a scaly reptile that has nothing to do with birds. The other is Cynornithosaurus, which according to AIG is a bird that has nothing to do with dinosaurs or reptiles. Now neither of these animals could fly, and note that their skeletons are almost completely identical. Why is it that creationists like Dr. Haynes say that one of these is a bird and the other isn't? Well, only one of them has been found with preserved feather impressions. Literally, that's it. If you find a dinosaur skeleton with associated feather impressions that they can't just brush off as collagen fibers, even if that's been debunked, they'll just say it's a bird. Cynornithosaurus is in no way a bird, and the opinion of a woman who doesn't even know what a pico style is is worthless to the question, regardless of whether or not she got a paleontology degree for identifying fossil beetle wings in Brazil. So it just shows that depending probably on the way in which it was fossilized, the amount of heat that was there at that time, you could have beta keratin, you could have alpha keratin. Yeah, which is the whole point. Something apparently only Georgia even barely managed to figure out, even if she's mostly ignoring it. But, you know, regardless of what this article says, how it goes back and forth and doesn't really come to any conclusion. Except that it does. The conclusion is that fossilized beta keratin looks like alpha keratin. That's it. That's the conclusion. It's right there in the article. It's not even a long or complex article to read. I mean, look at the title of the article. Dinosaur feathers may have been more bird-like than previously thought. The article doesn't actually show that or say mm -hmm. that yeah. at all. Yes, it directly does, because it shows that the alpha keratin-like fossils of non-avian dinosaur feathers may actually have been beta keratin in life, making those feathers more like those of true birds, meaning that dinosaur feathers may have been more bird-like than previously thought. Oh, hey, that's the actual title of the article. I'm honestly getting pretty pissed off that this panel of morons at best and mendacious hucksters at worst are just sitting lying to the faces of their entire audience and to me. There's a reason I say that this show is the worst. But again, it's you got to read closely what they're actually yep, finding. But that's even what the name of that dinosaur or that bird means that they think is a dinosaur. Chinese bird dinosaur. Yes. <laughs> Sino ornithosaurus. Okay, it's that's exactly what it is. Yeah, seems like a good name for a bird-like dinosaur from China, right? Almost like that's why they named it that. Because it's actually a bird. It's covered with feathers. It's morphologically nearly identical to Deinonychus. And then they go on to describe all these behaviors. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's yeah, this is great. They help them attract this is mates. They launch themselves into the air and, and could glide with their wings as they ran. Yeah, apparently dinosaurs can launch themselves in the air and glide from now, place those to place. Are... Actually, they don't describe those behaviors. They list them and provide links to other articles about those behaviors. It's a small point, but even here, they can't just be honest about the contents of the article. 
inferred behaviors, and we might not disagree with those things, but we can't know those things from the fossils. Behaviors are interpretations or inferences from the types of structures that we find, but we can't know them for certain. Welcome to the real world, where certainty is basically impossible. From those types of fossils, and it's a, that we you know, find. this is a type of historical science, right? We we can observe evidence today. I mean, we can see certain things today, but what we think about how those things came to be, basically, from what happened to them in the past, what was going on then, that is very much based on our worldview and our starting point. Do we start with God's word that tells us that dinosaurs and and birds are separate kinds, right? They're not related to one another, or the Bible says nothing of the sort. In fact, it doesn't mention dinosaurs once apart from birds. Further, this distinction about historical science is basically unique to creationists because they realize that science contradicts their ideas. So they try to cordon off certain parts of science into so-called historical science in order to lessen the impact on their flock of the fact that science so flatly contradicts nearly every one of their distinctive beliefs. Do we not? Because that's going to affect then how we interpret and understand these things. So. Yep. Yep. All right. BC nurse, meaning British Columbia, uh, risk losing license in witch trial over opposition to radical gender ideology. So, yeah, I'm not going to watch them go be turbo bigots on the air, nor will I subject my audience to their atrocious takes on the very existence of trans people. My trans audience members deserve better than that, and I will not serve that nonsense up. We'll come back when they have more science for us that isn't just them telling certain groups of people that they're not valid because they don't understand what the hell they're talking about. Just know that we're also skipping a story about a guy who was arrested for trespassing at an abortion clinic as part of his protest. I don't really care about him or the story, the arrest seems completely reasonable, and in fact, even from a pro-life standpoint, he was pretty clearly in the wrong, legally speaking. All right, the moon is 40 million years older than we thought. Tiny crystals from Apollo mission confirm. Okay, this is our weekly installment of how evolution has changed yet again. You'd think that if they wanted to have a weekly installment of evolution changing, they'd pick something that has to do with evolution. As a reminder, the scientific theory of evolution only concerns reproducing biological populations. If it's not that, it's not evolution. The formation and age of the moon is not evolution. All right, they're constantly writing and rewriting the story because that's what it is, it's a story. How dare scientists update their ideas in light of new evidence? Why? They should just stick to a narrative regardless of how much evidence contradicts it. You know, just like creationists do. Once again, this is creationists showing just how deeply they actually hate science despite their protestations to be pro-science. Based on man's ideas about the past rather than based on God's words. Actually, it's based on the evidence of physical reality rather than being based on the works of the men who wrote the books of the Bible. No matter how you slice it, scientists are not basing their ideas on the words of men, and creationists are, and even worse, just on their particular idiosyncratic and incoherent exegetical framework. So they're actually analyzing um, zircon crystals that were taken from the Apollo 17 mission. So they've been there uh, since 1972, so that's an amazing year because I was born in that year. I was gonna at least they're not moon hoaxers on top of being anti-vaxxers and believing that basically all of science is one big conspiracy to make everyone an atheist. And it's all based, though, on their story of, of how the moon came yeah, about. The nebular disc. No, actually, it's based on the direct measurement of the age of zircon crystals. That would remain the case no matter how the moon came about. Model, the spinning solar system, all that collection. But there are a lot of disputes about how the moon formed, and this one seems very very definitive that it's a, a collision model. That's one of the models out there. There are several other models. The reason this seems so definitive is because this model is the one that is currently dominant because all the other options fail to take into account or cannot explain significant aspects of the Earth-Moon system, but the impact hypothesis does. The article itself barely even exists being quite short. This one comes down really firm on the collision model, and there's all this language of this confirms this and this solidifies that and the only thing that the article says is now confirmed is the age of the zircons and the only thing that it uses the word solidify of is the crystals themselves apparently it's completely impossible for answers news to report on a pop star article without misrepresenting it all they're really doing is using a chain of assumptions mm -hmm. if this is true then this is true and if this is true then that's true and they work through this chain of assumptions to say the moon's 40 million years, years older than we thought that's technically true, but what are these assumptions? Well, that chemistry didn't just change in the past, and that nuclear physics didn't just change in the past. Again, that's just basic science. 
This objection is just, yeah, but they assumed science works when they did science. You can't just assume science when doing science. I would counter with the contention that you can't do science without the basic assumption of science. That is, that the rules of the universe are consistent regardless of time or place. Without this assumption, empiricism is right out the window, and you can never use past data to predict future data. In attacking the invariance of physics through time, the panel is attacking the very foundation of science, whether they like to call it historical or observational. Remember, all observations enter the past once they're made, and science assumes the same about the operation of the universe in the future as it does about the past, that it's invariant. Yeah, this That's whole study is based line. on, like Mitch was saying, there's like this collision model. There was a colossal collision uh, billions of years ago between Earth and the Mars-sized planet called Theia, or however you say it, essentially took that and then based on some of the material that blasted off, then formed the moon, and then over millions and billions of years, it was covered by this magma ocean and then solidified over time that created these zircon crystals. So they think if they date these zircon crystals, they can figure out how old the moon is. While this article does contextualize the finding in the context of the impact hypothesis for the formation of the moon, the study is not based on that. All current scientific models for the formation of the moon as a body involve an initial molten state, and from this state, zircons could and did form. Whether this state was the result of coalescence around the Earth from the same cloud of dust, whether the moon formed elsewhere and was captured into an orbit, or whether it was formed from the impact of a Mars-sized object with the early Earth, the moon started out as a magma, and so this dating remains valid for all currently proposed scientific, that is not magical, hypotheses of lunar formation, meaning that the dating is valid for any of them. Even if the article assumes the validity of the hypothesis currently best supported by the evidence, at least according to the people who have dedicated their lives to answer questions about the formation of the moon. But again, that all relies on the assumption. If the assumption is wrong, the conclusion is going to be wrong. That's what we see all the time with these evolutionary uh, articles. They never question whether the model is actually true or not. It's true. Science doesn't question whether or not science is true or not. It kind of just assumes that empiricism is valid, even though in a strictly formally logical sense, it's hard to justify. But then the assumption of the temporal and spatial invariance of the operation of the universe has so far allowed humans vast and reliable advancements in technology, medicine, communication, navigation, and prediction of natural disasters, as well as allowed hugely increased destructive capabilities. If the fundamental assumption of science, the only assumption that isn't just a conclusion of other science that this article makes, were true, then it's hard to explain why science just keeps on working, despite the protestations of all these anti-science bigots that it shouldn't. And just, just a reminder here, I mean, when we're looking at the moon... Um, you know, they're talking about these direct age determinations and approaches. There is no direct measurement. It's not you, a there's not like a yardstick or some was, tag yeah. that shows you, yep, the Earth, the, the moon is, is this age. Again, it comes down to interpretation. That's just literally the flat Earth argument that no one can measure the diameter of the Earth or its radius or its equatorial circumference because no one has a tape measure long enough. All measurements involve calculations either directly by the measurer or in the manufacturer of the measuring instruments. There is really no such thing as a direct measurement in science. Just measuring the distance from the Ark Encounter to the Creation Museum involves calculations. And yet, after this direct use of a flat Earth argument, I'll still probably get people telling me that young Earth creationists are not the intellectual equivalent of flat Earthers. And that's unfair. Well, creationists out there, if you don't want me to think of you as equal to flat Earthers in terms of anti-science beliefs and complete inanity, maybe stop stealing flat Earth arguments. And really, this whole research is based on the unobservable past, assumption upon assumption upon assumption. Nope, only one unevidenced assumption. After that, it's using the conclusions of past science without needing to repeat all the research that reached that conclusion. This is how science advances. We don't need to start from scratch for each bit of research. 
When previous research comes to a strong and so far unchallenged conclusion, you get to import that conclusion more or less for free into new research. But when you drill down the only assumption that's made that is made without being the conclusion of previous research, and therefore not really an assumption, is the one I've been going on about, that the universe operates consistently throughout time and space. Really naturalistic storytelling. Why? Well, it's because they need to have everything in the solar system formed by naturalistic processes, right? They refuse to give God the glory here. Fun fact, science isn't the monopoly of atheists and agnostics. There are plenty of theists and even Christian scientists in all fields of science, astronomy and planetary science included. So, and, and guess what guys, the Bible is the true history book of the universe. Anytime we have a question on history, we need to have a reliable historical document. When we start with God's word, we know the perfectly designed moon, uh, it, it should not lead us to these naturalistic stories, but rather to glorify the God who made it on day four of creation week. That wasn't even a coherent thought. I think that one got away from him. But no, Genesis is not a history book. It's obviously mythological and assumes a flat earth with a dome over it that has windows to let in rain and snow. It's hard to even imagine a less reliable book when it comes to the actual history of the moon and solar system, never mind the universe. A universe that the authors thought was smaller than we know even the earth to be now. Think about that. The authors of Genesis thought that all of creation was smaller than earth actually is. The view of the universe of Genesis, if taken literally, is so unbelievably parochial that it's hard to understand why any person who's ever traveled to another continent would ever take it seriously as a literal account of the creation of the world. And that's also it. After that, they just announced some conferences that they're hosting, and since they're not paying me, and instead will probably falsely copyright claim me, I don't feel like giving them non-fair use advertisement space on my platform. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, hit like and tell me in the comments. If you didn't, feel free to hit dislike and tell me what the problem was again in the comments. Either way, please remember to subscribe and hit that bell icon so you're always notified when I have more content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Hey, before you leave, I just want to take a second to thank my patrons and channel members, especially those pledging $20 or above. Ben Tovind, Phil Gavara, Tapioca Weasel, Whispers, Denny5252, Elrond Teller, Ian Chen, Kelvin Brostick Van Manen, Landon Knoll, Mabity Babity, Monkey They Them, Sphincter of Doom, Ita V, Strawberry Vane, and Star Runner. It's because of my channel members and patrons whom you're seeing on screen that this channel can stay afloat. Without you, it would all shut down. If you want to join the team, there's a link to join the channel below this video, and there's a link to join the Patreon in the description. On the Patreon, you can get a 10% discount for pledging annually, and either way, you get early access to virtually all of my scripted videos, often three to five months before they come out for the general public. Thanks for watching.